Jesus, Friend of Sinners, that happens to be our title this morning. As we open up the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, it has been some time since we've been in this Gospel, but we are making our way through it. Today is the 90th week that we have been in Luke's Gospel, and we've made it up to chapter 15. So that's where we are this morning, Luke 15, 1 through 10. As we talk about Jesus is a friend of sinners. Now, as you're turning to Luke chapter 15, I want you to think about this. How would you feel if the most hated person in the world or the most hated or despised person throughout history sat next to you in a restaurant? How would you feel? Now, some of you say, well, I'm married to that person, but let's not, let's not go that. That's a different message. We're doing a conference on that later in the year. No, but uh, how would you feel? If someone that you truly despise or despise you sat next to you, and you most many of us would might just maybe whisper, talk among yourselves. Maybe you might sit up and ask for another table. If they were taking you near that table, you say, well, I, 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 I don't want to sit there. I mean, that would be something that we would just say, well, I don't know how I would feel if it was, it was a Hitler or some political enemy or culture warrior that we just didn't care for. Would you open up your home and invite them over for dinner? Most likely, there's, there's family and friends that we don't do that to, right? Or at least family, right? Most likely not. You may even criticize someone who did do that. Why are you inviting them over? Why are you, have, why are you talking to them? Why don't you take my side? Well, how would you feel if that one person you did not get along with, the one you got along with the least, they came and, vi and visited our church today? You turned and they came through that door. That person who just made your life terrible. That person, you, and they wanted to sit down. How would we feel if some of the homeless or others that wanted to come in, not cleaned, just leave their bags and sit down? Would you move? Would you kind of move away? Would you not want them to be there? Would you go and greet them during our shaking of hands and time to come? How would you feel it was your political opposition? If they came to Christ, I accepted Christ, would we want them? Do we pray that they would? How we respond to people and how we view them has eternal consequences, especially if our attitude keeps them from hearing the word of God or prevents us from praying that they come to Christ. How many times have we internally or externally criticized, complained, and wish ill on those we would consider our enemies or at least in opposition to our faith, our way of life, and our beliefs? How often do we pray for them that they may come to know Christ or that God would show his favor upon them and be drawn to the truth? Or do we just pray the imprecatory prayers of Psalm? Lord, strike them down. Lord, let a fist break their nose. Things of that nature. How often are we like the religious leaders of Christ's time? Luke is a physician by trade, but he also serves as his historian of the early church. He was a companion of the Apostle Paul, and he sought out eyewitness accounts who were eyewitnesses of the life and ministry of Jesus, those who were alive and witnessed what Jesus did, and he's recording their testimonies. Let no one ever tell you that there is no early historical facts about Christ. Luke is a true historian book, just as much as any ancient historian book might exist He is the writer of both the gospel and that bears his name that we're studying and also as well as the Acts of the Apostle, which is another book of history. Now this section that we've been looking at, Luke chapter 13 to Luke chapter 17, we're in the middle, about 15. That section records the events that transpire as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem onto his divine appointment at the cross. He knows his time is short. He knows that his time of death is very near. Knowing that time is short, he is using the time to impart final instructions and warnings to his disciples in preparation for his crucifixion, 
his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. He knows that he will not be there much longer. And the disciples are going to be those who will turn the world upside down. So he's preparing them with last instructions, encouragements, and warnings. And here's the thing that we've learned as we've been studying this. When he's talking about what is a disciple, and that's how we ended last, uh, last uh, I, what was it, May or June when we finished up Luke 14, is that Jesus demands an uncompromising commitment. I want you to write this down if you haven't gotten it. Jesus demands an uncompromising commitment for those who choose to follow him. We've seen that, right? Whoever follows me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, in our passage today, we find that the religious leaders are once again complaining and criticizing Jesus and the company he keeps. So Luke chapter 15, the first part of the verse is going to be here on there. But again, I want you to encourage you to bring your Bibles. If you need one, let me know. I'd love to give, a, give you a copy of God's word. But in Luke chapter 15, we read this. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, speaking of Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Father, I pray that you give us your wisdom. I thank you for Luke and his endeavor to capture the eyewitness accounts. The Holy Spirit has preserved this testimony for us even today. It is accurate. It is one that we can rely on. It is a true book of history, but also a true work of Christ and the Spirit together. And I pray as we open it up that we... Uh, are thankful, show gratitude for the privilege of reading your word, that you've revealed yourself to us, that we can have certainty about the facts of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would just stir our hearts this morning. Lord, as we read through these parables and we understand about the Pharisees and Jesus being a friend of sinner, what does that mean? And Father, what does that mean not only to us, but then how does that compel us now for us to live in this day and age? I pray that you give us your wisdom and discernment in your name. Amen. Now, as we've noticed throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus' life and ministry has been attracting the marginalized, the outcasts, and the helpless. Anywhere he goes, he is pressed about people that most people would not have anything to do with. The tax collectors were those revenue collectors for the hated and despised Roman government. It's the IRS to you and I. Uh, we, you know, this, this is not a group of people that were endeared uh, by, the, by the Jewish people. While the, for, while the term sinners was a catch-all phrase for the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And these people were drawn to Jesus. Luke records that this group of people were drawing near to Jesus, meaning that they were seeking Jesus out. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to listen to him. They wanted to hear them, hear him. It was a habit of Jesus to receive these groups and minister to them. Jesus touched the untouchable. Jesus spoke to the unspeakable. He loved the unlovable. Of course, these were the exact people that Jesus came to minister. As he pronounced in Luke chapter 14, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said at the, ministry, at the beginning of his ministry. He says, because the father has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. However, the religious leaders considered these groups sinful and guilty of absolute moral failure. They lived in a day that if you were poor, if you were crippled, if you were blind, if life was difficult for you, you deserved it because of your sin. They were deserving of God's punishment for violating God's law. Hence, they were constantly complaining and grumbling and muttering against Jesus because he would receive those that they feel that God had rejected. If you're from God as you say you are, if you are the Messiah, why are you receiving and, and dealing with people that God has utterly rejected? The common complaint about Jesus is found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, where it says the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It doesn't matter if Jesus was with the poor, if he was with the rich. They were always 
grumbling and complaining that he was receiving those that they felt were undeserving. Now, the Pharisees, just as a reminder, was an influential group of religious leaders who exacted strict demands from the people while exempting themselves from those laws. Does that sound familiar? Seems like we live in a lot of that today. So they would put demanding laws on them, but they themselves would not have to follow him. The scribes were a class of learned men who were teachers and experts in the law. They believed, by the way, that this rejection of these sinners and tax collectors, they believed that their grumbling against Jesus had, had biblical merit as they would follow the advice of Psalms chapter 1, 1, where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sets in the seat of scoffers. They were just taking God at his word, King David at his word. So for them, they were perfectly right. They had a biblical uh, uh, precedent for it. And they now are questioning Jesus' godliness and the commitment to the law of Moses as they continually did about the Sabbath, about the washing of hands, so on and so forth. Now, when it says that Jesus received these sinners, to receive means to welcome, to accept, and admit access to. This is what they were grumbling against. And when it says that Jesus ate with them, that was more than you and I just sitting down and having a meal. To that, that by implication, that was meant to associate with someone or to live on familiar terms. Eating together was much more of a big thing than it is today. And this was just too much for them. They could not stand this. This Jesus, this is one of the reasons they rejected him because of this practice. Jesus should have been eating and receiving the religious leaders, the political bigwigs and the emissaries of the king, not lowly sinners. But of course, we know that Jesus ate and drank with them as well, as we saw earlier in Luke's gospel. But he should not be doing this with lowly sinners. Now, through the writings of Luke and the testimony of these eyewitness accounts, The Holy Spirit is pointing out to us a very big problem of the religious leaders, one that you and I need to be very, very careful to avoid, not to adopt. And that's the self-righteous attitude that led to contempt for others, contrary to the law. Remember, the law says to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And, And they were not doing that, for they were looking down on contempt. Now, you and I have this type of attitude many times with some of the people I just mentioned in our introduction. How many times that we avoid contact, making eye contact, or avoiding someone? Whether it's maybe someone who's in the streets, or someone who's drug addict, or someone who's just in our family, or someone else. Many times we have contempt. And contempt is not an attitude. It's not a hard attitude that anyone should have that professes Christ. We're not to look down on people. In scripture, grumbling is a sign of a rebellious heart. And this is important for us to understand. For you and I do this very often, muttering and complaining and grumbling. But grumbling is actually a sign, (coughs) excuse me, of a rebellious heart. We see examples of this in the Old Testament with Israel as they were traveling through the wilderness. Remember those 40 years of, of wandering through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. You see, it says, your grumbling is not against us, but against whom? Shout it out to me. Lord, we have to realize that. How many times have you grumbled against where you live, the car you drive, the salary you make, the people that God put in your life, your family, your friends? And you and I need to recognize that when you and I are complaining and muttering, we are not complaining and muttering against our circumstances and about things outside our control. We are actually complaining against uh, God, Yahweh, who is providential and sovereign over all areas of our lives. But how often have we done that? How much, how many times have we grumbled and complained about our spouse? Because they haven't met the expectations that we have. How many times have we done that about our children? Maybe we've even done it about ourselves. If I was taller, if I had more hair. Does that sound personal to you? (laughs) Maybe. But we need to understand that. That's why Paul says, do all things with what? without grumbling or disputing. Or Peter says, show hospitality, receive one another without grumbling 
These are important things for us to understand. These attitudes were very similar to their ancient ancestors who grumbled against Yahweh. Their contempt for the ordinary people was sinful and their criticism of Jesus was unwarranted. The religious leaders should be the ones drawing near to Jesus and accepting him. Yet they did not. They would not answer their criticism and to give hope to those who are sitting there and listening to this. You ever ever have someone speak to you as if you're not there? As you're speaking to someone else? To answer their criticism, to give hope and encouragement to those who are being maligned. Jesus tells them a series of parables. And in these parables, we find the solution to this hard-hearted, rebellious, and sinful attitude of contempt, of grumbling and complaining. A parable is simply an earthly story, usually about normal things in life that have a heavenly meaning, a spiritual truth. Jesus would use them to teach people about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like. However, they were only understandable by those who had ears to hear and eyes to see. So many times they went over the heads of those he told. They normally would have a surprise ending that was meant to call the hearer to repentance. So they're more than just a rhetorical device, but it's to call someone to repentance. I'm talking about you. Oh, I wish I had that R.C. Sproul uh, video where he says, I'm talking about, was it he said that? No, that was, what's wrong with you? That was Paul Washer. What's wrong with you people? I'm talking about you. So with that, let's look at the parable of the lost sheep and the coin. I know you know this story. Many of you could stand up and tell them, but let's go ahead and read it again silently as I read out loud. We're in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 10 to this morning. So Jesus says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country? See, you get it. He, he has a hundred sheep. He has uh, one, and one goes off. Uh, how many, he says, would not leave them in the open country and go after the one that is lost? So he has, says, these there are here. These here are safe and secure in some form or fashion. It's an open country, but I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to go find the one until he finds it. Now, obviously, it's rhetorical. It should be, of course, all, any shepherd, good shepherd, would do that. In verse 5, and when he has found it, He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, giving us a picture that he's actually picking it up and putting it over his shoulders and carrying it, whether it's because it's it's lamed or whatnot or just because it's rebellious, he needs to carry it back home. Verse 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But then he goes on and tells another one in verse 8. Or what about that woman who having 10 silver coins? Now, one coin was about worth one day's wages. So whatever you make in a day, it's about a day's wages. And if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. Of course she's going to do that. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of, over, over, uh, angels of God over one sinner who repents. So it seems kind of odd. We're talking about sheep and a coin. But then all of a sudden he's talking about sinners and rejoicing in heaven. What in the world is going on here? But here's the thing we need to understand. In both instances, it was not that the person suffered much loss. It was only one sheep out of 99. How many of you would say, oh, well, you know, you drop a penny, do you pick it up? Do you drop a dollar in a, in, in a grate? Do you see a dollar in a grate filled with mud? Do you actually bend down and pick it up? Probably not. Depends, on, I guess, how old you are, how desperate you might be. But you put those, you make those a little bit higher. You know, maybe it's $50, $100. Maybe it's a work purse or something. Then maybe you're, you're ready to do that. But it's just, why would he leave, leave 99? What something happens to the 99? And it's not just only one coin. She still had nine. What, what's wrong? The key point of the parables is found in verses 7 and verse 10. And I want to read them again. He says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then verse 10, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God 
over one sinner who repents. So Jesus here is talking more than about a sheep and a coin and it being found. They represent something much greater. The theme or the point of this parable, if you're taking notes, is that you and I should respond with joy. We are to respond with joy in receiving others into the kingdom of God. This was the problem of the Pharisees. As they are seeing people drawn into Jesus and and committed to follow him, they want to complain that these people are not worthy. So they had contempt. They were complaining. They were not rejoicing that tax collectors and sinners were turning and coming to Christ. Now there's two things to notice in those, those parables. Number one, the shepherd and the woman are the ones who go searching for the lost items. Okay? It's the shepherd and the woman who, are, who, goes, are, who are the ones who go searching. It's not the lamb wandering and finding his way back to the shepherd. It's not the coin saying, here I am, here I am. You know? Why? Because they cannot. It is the good shepherd and it is the woman who goes searching for that which is lost. It is they who find value in the one sheep and in the one coin. The other sheep may say, where are you going? You're leaving us out to the wolves? What about that? You're going after one sheep? Forget about him. He was always a problem anyway. Maybe the coins are saying, wait a minute, aren't we valuable enough? What if we fall? But it's, they who, it, but it's not they who go finding. It's the shepherd and the woman. And not only that, they are only received, when it's talking about being found and being received into the kingdom, it's when they repent. Both the lost sheep and the lost coin represent a person who repents. So the sheep is more than just a sheep. The coin is more than just a coin. They represent the people that Jesus is searching and looking for. He's looking for that which was uh, lost. He's looking for those that have gone astray. And he's coming to find them. And when he says that he finds them, it's those who repent and come and follow Jesus. To be found means one who that turns towards Christ. And that's what we're seeing in this collection of what they were calling tax collectors and sinners. They did not recognize that these were the very people that Jesus was looking for. Hence why Jesus is filled with joy. Theologian Thomas Schreiner notes in this passage is that Jesus does not merely eat with and accept sinners. Anyone can be friends with winners and do what they do. That's what they want. Pharisees and the scribes, we're the winners, eat with us. But Jesus is seeking them out and calling them to repentance so that the promises of Ezekiel 34 that Landon read earlier might be filled. You may recall that Yahweh declares in Ezekiel 34, 16, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured. And I will strengthen the weak. The whole accusation in Ezekiel is that the shepherds, the religious leaders, have abandoned their duties. They're allowing the one to fall away. They're allowing the one who is misplaced to continue to be lost. As long as I have the nine, and as long as I have the 99, then I'm okay. These are the ones that are doing what they're supposed to do. This was the very purpose of Christ in coming to earth. You'll see here on the monitor. Jesus says the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He goes on to say, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You can hold that up for just a moment. You may ask, well, what does it mean to be received? Jesus is teaching, as we see these passages, that even those considered the worst of all sinners are received through the mercy and grace found through their acceptance of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who goes searching for the lost, while the Holy Spirit draws them to the goodness of God, taste and see that he is good. And the Father who is granting them grace, repentance and faith. This is the very essence of the gospel. 
And that's what I would call you today. You today might be one of the lost sheep. You might be the lost coin. Let me share with you, Jesus is searching out those that the Father has given them. He is shining his light out. He is calling to that sheep, come, come, follow me. And I pray today that if you hear his voice, instead of running from him, that you would say, here I am. That your desire is to be found, to recognize that you are lost and that you need a savior and that you will repent from your dead works. And what do I mean by that? Repentance from dead works means that you understand that you cannot be made right with God. You cannot get into heaven just because of who you are or what you've done or who your grandmother was or how long you've gone to church, how much charity you do. It's only by the works of Christ that you and I could ever enter into heaven. It's through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. For all have sinned. All come short of the glory of God. All are in need of a Savior. And because of our sin, the Bible tells us, because of our inherited sin, not the things we do, but just because we are born, it says that we are guilty. And that the penalty of that sin is what? It's death. Separated from the eternal goodness of God. It's not separation from God. Let me tell you, those that are in hell will be in the very presence of God as he pours out his wrath with no goodness, no mercy, no grace, no kindness given to them. That may be you here today. It may be your family and friends. But let me share with you as God is calling you out. And when you repent from your dead works, recognizing that I cannot be saved by my works, but only by the works of Christ, I trust in that. I ask, I recognize that I am lost. Please let me be found. The Savior will come and wrap and put you around his neck, so to speak, as we think of the sheep. And he brings us into the fold of God's children. And the Bible says when that happens, that the angels rejoice. And you and I are to rejoice, even when those that are lost are those that we might hold contempt or despise. If we have that type of attitude, then we show ourselves to be Pharisees. We show ourselves to be against God himself. How often have we felt, you know, we, uh, some of you are old enough to remember um, Ted Bundy. Remember Ted Bundy killed 30 plus women mainly nurses, young ladies, found right before he uh, got the death penalty, I believe in Florida. Uh, the news came out that he had accepted Christ through Focus on the Family, James Dobson. I've never been able to confirm that myself, but that's what they say. And then our thoughts is, what, what, how do you feel about that? Would you want to see Ted Bundy walking down the golden streets with you? We would say, no, he deserves death. He deserves, but, but God saves even the worst of sinners. I pray that that story is true. I do not know. But could God save a Ted Bundy? Could God save a Putin? Yes. Do we pray for them? Or do we pray for them to be their demise, for their fall? Do we rejoice when they fall? when they have difficulty in life. Jesus truly is a friend of sinners. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to John chapter 15. And as you're turning to John 15, Jesus proclaimed in Luke 7, he says, the son of man has come eating and drinking. You say, look at him, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of, uh, of collectors and uh, sinners. Yes, Jesus is a friend of drunkards and of tax collectors and sinners. Again, in Luke 5, he says, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. I've come to call the righteous, not, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then if you're with me in John chapter 15, look at verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What a great friend. Underline that if you have uh, your Bible or if you're able to highlight it in your tablet, your phone, whatever. You are my friends if you do what I command you. 
No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. What is Jesus about? Jesus is about making friends. The Pharisees were about making barriers, obstacles, setting barriers around themselves. Jesus was about knocking those down and bringing people in. Kevin DeYoung, a pastor, I, I truly uh, like, I love what he does. If you ever buy any of his books, I re highly recommend them. He's writing for the Gospel Coalition. I believe I have this up here. Thank you, Ben. He says, Jesus was a friend of sinners, not because he winked at sin. And this is where we're, you and I need to, 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 to spend some time here in a minute. Is Jesus was a friend of sinners, not because he winked at sin, ignored sin, or enjoyed lighthearted revelry with those engaged in immorality. Jesus was a friend of sinners in that he came to save sinners. And he was very pleased to welcome sinners who were open to the gospel, sorry for their sins, and on their way to putting their faith in him. Jesus didn't come to save the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't believe they needed to be saved. They didn't believe they were sick. Let me tell you, if you want to be a friend of Jesus, you need to admit that you are sick. You need to admit that you are a sinner, that you are lost and that you are in need, that you're in a dusty corner just waiting for him to shine the light and to sweep you up. That you're in a ditch ready for him to pull you up and carry you. That is the only way to be a friend of Jesus Christ. Or you can prefer to be a Pharisee make your own way to heaven I'm sharing with you that you'll be rejected he says I'll never knew you depart from me I love this Jesus is a friend of Peter the man who suffered from foot and mouth disease he was always saying something and putting his foot on oh I will never let you die I will never betray you and I will never do this and what did Jesus say get behind me Satan you know you're talking Satan talk but he's a friend of Peter. Jesus was a friend of James and John, the sons of thunder, who were ready to call down fire and destroy whole cities because they rejected the ministry. Of Je Jesus was a friend of those two men. You got a temper? Jesus can be your friend. He was a friend of Louis Little Zacchaeus, a tax collector, a man who climbed a sycamore tree, so to speak. I don't know if it was a sycamore tree. That's the song. Who wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus saw him. Do you want Jesus to see you? Jesus was a friend of a man named Saul who became also named Paul, who was a terrorist, a, Christ, a, a terrorist of Christians, dragging people out of their, out of their homes, full families, imprisoning them, putting them to death. Jesus was a friend of a man who called himself the chiefest, the worst of all sinners. Jesus is a friend of mine. He's a friend of you, I pray. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Now, Jesus is calling us not to adopt the attitude of the religious leaders, but to join with the angels in receiving the unworthy, the rebellious, the unlovable, and the untouchable sinners into the kingdom of God. That's what you and I need to be about. See, we need to see people in a different way. We are not to erect artificial barriers and obstacles to their hearing the good news of the gospel. As the gospel attracts them, we should not try to push them away. We are to receive their adoption into the family of God just as you and I were received into the adoption of God's family. But there's two warnings here. So we, we think, okay, Jesus is a friend of sinners, then you and I need to be friends of sinners as well so that we may share with him the gospel. And I, and I think that's the point that we're trying to make. We're not to be the Pharisees who hold people with contempt, but we want to make friends with them so they can also become friends of Christ. But there's two warnings I want to share. The first one is do not be a Jonah. 
We've talked about this before. Look at Jonah chapter 3. You might recall Jonah was sent to Nineveh. He says, go and preach, uh, not the gospel at that time, but go and preach. Tell them that I'm going to destroy their city or they're going, and they need to repent. Now, Jonah, as you know, ran the other way, wound up being thrown into the, the, into the ocean. A fish, a great fish, came and swallowed him. He spent three days, three nights there before he finally repented. God spit him back out on the ground and he went to Nineveh and he preached. But the thought is, why did he not want to preach there? And we find it here, up here on the monitor, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil, evil, evil ways, talking about Nineveh. Now, by the way, Nineveh was, was, a, was a very warlike nation. Uh, they would tear the flesh off their, their victims' faces and wear them as kind of like Halloween masks, so to speak. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So he didn't destroy them. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was what? Angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, this is not this, or is this, or is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and you're merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, Lord, take my life from me for it is better to die than to live. I can't believe you accepted these people. I can't believe you gave them mercy and grace. And unfortunately, let us not be that way. So let us not be Jonah's. Who, when we hear of someone's salvation, or we when we hear someone give the gospel, we're like Jonah says, No, no, no. Don't give them grace and mercy. Give them the wrath. Give them the burning, you know, coals. Can't be the Jonah's of this world. But on the other hand, here's the second warning: is do not compromise in your relationship with the lost. Do not become friends with sinners in such a way that you lose your testimony that you now are compromised. The Bible does warn us against uh, who we surround ourselves with. In Proverbs chapter 13, 20, we read that whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companions of fools will suffer harm. The old phrase, you've heard me say it, show me your friends and I'll show you your future echoes the warning of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians when he says, bad companies ruin good morals. And some of you could say, yes, I come from a good family, but I, I, I hung around with people in the neighborhood that led me the wrong way. And, and so we understand that. And then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where Paul warns this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, that's Satan? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We're, we're specially, we're, we're the body of Christ. In verse 17 he says, Therefore because of this, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So the, the Pharisees would probably agree with that. But yet the Bible does call us to still, we are to be friends of sinners as Jesus is. We are to interact with those around us. Some of them are our spouses. Some of them are our family members, our children, and our friends, and, and so on and so forth. Our co-workers, our neighbors. So what does it mean to be a friend of sinner? Of sinners. Let me tell you, we must be careful that we guard our hearts so that, we, that, so that our friendships and relationships do not lead us to compromise our commitment to Christ. Remember, he's asking for an uncompromising commitment. However, we have seen many are, are, are compromising their commitment to God, to his word. Sin has made inroads in the hearts of those who profess Christ and the believers and the institution of the church itself is when, when we, they demand these things from us. First, the people that we have friends with will say, well, you need to allow mine. I'm going to use the example of just the uh, LGBT stuff that's going on. Is you need to allow our behavior. You need to allow it. 
And that's not enough just to allow it, so let's make laws, let's, let's allow it to happen. And so many of us say, okay, well, let's live and let live, right? So you know what, if it doesn't affect me, that's all right. They can have their marriage and it doesn't affect my marriage, which we're seeing that it actually is now today. So that's okay. So what if in the school library they have those types of books that are really pornography books? Just allow it. I just will keep my kids from watching it, looking at it. But see, that's not enough. Because when we're hanging with our friends, we say, well, I like this person. We're in groups together. We're, we do these hobbies together. And so I, I, you know, they, I, I'm going to allow them to do that. I'm not going to stop them from doing that. I'm going to allow them. But see, the next step is not only to allow. They want you then to accept their behavior, their attitudes, and their beliefs. And so now you need to accept it. Okay, well, I guess it's, I just won't tell them that it's sin. I won't, I won't tell them it's wrong. But then we go on where they say, it's not only do you need to allow and accept, but you need to approve of my behavior. We need laws. We need protections. You need to approve on your site. You need to let me know that you're an ally of mine. I need to see your pronouns. You need to speak it. I need to understand it. You need to approve it. But then it goes on. Then you not only need to prove it, but I need you to affirm it. I need you to say that this is good. And no longer do you say, well, what, we've gone to this place where we say, well, uh, what does scripture say? Do not say what is good. We call good evil and evil good. And so now we're now affirming their lifestyle and their choices. And then the next thing is we're advancing it. And this is what's happened in many families. Some of you are seeing this. They've said the biggest thing that has changed in those who profess Christ or those that are in religious homes, what has changed their mind about LGBT, area, LGBT uh, things is when a family member comes out as gay or bi or transgender. And what you see is that how is a father going to respond to that? How is a mother going to respond to that? Or a brother? And so what we see, instead of the word of God becoming our standard and our proof, we allow our relationships with our family members, our friends, and so on to affect us. And now just not allowing it, we're now affirming it. We're accepting of it. And now we're advancing it because we love them, we care for them. We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be canceled out. Many people and families are struggling with this today because they have loved ones and friends that advocate for lifestyles that are leading them straight into hell. And we're supposed to be silent. We're not sweeping the corners. We're not lighting a lamp looking for the lost coin. We're no longer acting as shepherds of God looking for that lost sheep. Unfortunately, those who profess Christ many times value the status quo of their relationship rather than suffer any ridicule or rejection for confronting sin. The world has trained us well. Be silent and stay in your place. Never confront sin. Never share with anyone that how they believe is wrong. For it is their truth. And if it goes against your truth, you're the one who needs to compromise. That's now been not only advocated, in almost every media, social media, media in the large. But now we're finding it codified in our laws. We find it codified in our workplaces to where you must not only accept it, but you must advance it. But let me share with you as this last word on this point. If we're going to be the friends of sinners as Jesus was in receiving and eating with those that are under God's wrath, we cannot lose our light, as God has called us to be light. We cannot lose our salt, our saltiness, as he's called us the salt of the earth. We cannot lose our fragrance, as we are the aroma of Christ, in order to gain friends and influence. See, you're going to have to be called into account one day. And my friend, you need to make a stand. And that is going to cause ripples in your life and in your friendships and your families. It's going to cost you something. But that's why Jesus calls for an uncompromising commitment. We can neither be Pharisees who look on contempt on those who are undeserving, or we would consider undeserving, 
But we also cannot be such friends of sinners that we no longer are any salt or light and we lose our testimony and we're not calling them to Christ. And so there's a balance that you and I must face to be a friend of sinners as Jesus was a friend of sinners. So let me get to this and we'll close. There are three things I want us to consider this morning of how we can be friends of sinners. And I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. If you can be friends of sinners, drawing them to Christ, praying that they, be found, that they are found as they repent of their sins and turn to fellow Christ, these three things. Very simple. You need a compassion for the lost. You need to see your lost friend, family member, not as just someone you value, which they are, but they're also made in the image of God, but they're also lost. We need to recognize that their mind is actually hostile to the things of God. They are children of disobedience. The Bible says that they're objects of wrath. We need to recognize that they are blinded by the God of this world, speaking of Satan. So we need to have compassion on them as Jesus looked upon the crowds and was put to compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. You and I need to have compassion on them, knowing that if they continue rejecting Christ and rebelling against Christ, then their life is forfeit at the end. So is, do you care more for your friend or do you care more for your own reputation, your own friendship. Number two is you need to pray for God to give you the courage to confront. This is very difficult. Some of you had to do this before. It's that time for intervention. Now, I'm not saying that, hey, listen, my friend, you need to turn and burn right now or turn or burn right now. It's, it's developing that friendship, that, that commitment, to share with them the gospel, to give them a new way of looking and leave, to pray for them, to care for them, to invite them to church, to, to share with them, listen, what you're doing, this, this behavior is wrong. It will lead you in the wrong direction. We need courage to confront those that we care about. And thirdly, we need to celebrate and rejoice. And I think that's something that we miss. I think we need to have more celebration and rejoicing when people do repent and come to Christ. We need to make a big deal about it. We need, we need to bring them in. And, and even when we hear it's someone that we don't care for, we need to celebrate and rejoice. Why? Because someone who was lost is now found. Someone who was an enemy of God has now become a friend of Christ. Why? Because you and I were once enemies of Christ ourselves. But now we're found. And now we're friends of Jesus Christ. Let me close with this verse, Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. I believe it's here on the monitor. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's what you and I need to say, come. It says that the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. That's what you and I are doing. We're just carriers of buckets of water and say, do you want to drink? Taste and see that God is good. Let us be friends of sinners that draw them to Christ, rejoicing when they come to repentance. Let us do that and let us glorify God in that, praying for our friends in that way. With everybody head bowed and everybody closed as Randy comes up and the worship team. <coughs> I just want to take a moment just to pause and consider these parables. The attitude and the heart of the Pharisees and just how awful it is but seeing that God loves us and he gives us his grace and kindness. So let's consider that this morning. Let's give thanks that once we who were lost, God has now found. Those of us who were once enemies are now friends of Christ. And would you pray and ask God to give you a greater compassion, a greater sense of courage, and a greater sense of celebration so that we may respond in the right way that the Holy Spirit is working. Would you do so this morning? Randy, would you come and close us in prayer? We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.